I'm Corey Astle. And I'm Kyle Salmon. Welcome to Conservative Minds, a podcast dedicated to examining conservative intellectual history to determine the core values of American conservatism. What does it mean to call yourself a conservative? What did it mean in prior times? And how did we get where we are today? We explore these questions and more by turning to a con- conservative political thinkers from the past and present. Each episode, we select readings and conduct a discussion to share with you our investigation. If you want to join the discussion, like us on Facebook or follow us on Twitter at, at @consminds. That's at C-O-N-S-M-I-N-D-S. For episode three, we read Ideas Have Consequences by Richard Weaver from 1948. Richard Weaver was born in Nashville, North Carolina in 1910, first of four children. His father, who owned a livery stable, died when Richard was only six and his mother was expecting their last child. The family eventually resettled in Lexington, Kentucky, where his mother managed Embry and Company, a millinery business owned by her brother. Weaver was known as a shy and bookish boy, but he blossomed socially in college at the University of Kentucky. His political and intellectual outlook took longer to develop. By the time he graduated in 1932, uh, the Great Depression at its deepest ebb, Weaver, like many others, had evolved into a full-fledged socialist. He served as secretary of the University of Kentucky Socialist Party, and during Norman Thomas's presidential campaign, rose to be secretary of the statewide party. After a brief time as a graduate student in the English department at UK, Weaver transferred to Vanderbilt and studied under John Crow Ransom, a professor of the Southern Agrarian School of Thought. Ransom no doubt helped shape Weaver's ideas and cultivate an interest in explaining Southern political tradition. While writing his dissertation, Weaver taught at Texas A&M from 1937 to 1940. He soon grew tired of teaching what he later called the cliches of liberalism. Weaver transferred to Louisiana State University, where he studied under Clinth Brooks, a leading light in Southern poetry and literary criticism. After earning his PhD and developing his political consciousness in a different direction. He he taught briefly at North Carolina State and then was hired to teach at the University of Chicago. Weaver taught survey courses for which he earned awards for excellent teaching and found time to publish. His most famous publication, debuting in 1948, was the book we'll discuss today, Ideas Have Consequences. After initially sluggish sales, the book took off. Weaver was offered a permanent position at Chicago, which he accepted. He also delivered lectures across the nation and wrote for conservative publications. Shortly before his death, he accepted an English position at Vanderbilt, planning at last to return to the South. But he never returned. On April 2nd, 1962, at the height of his academic career, Weaver died suddenly of a heart attack at the age of 53. All right, so on its face, uh, ideas have consequences is a formal treatment of nominalism. And so just a little background. Nominalism is a philosophical view that denies the existence of universals. It has a long history that traces back to some medieval thinkers and their critique of Plato's metaphysical forms. Uh, In brief, nominalism stands for the view that classifications of the world are arbitrary. For example, uh, when we identify something with the property of green, we're not accessing the essence of what is green. There's no universal and absolute green. Instead, Green is a convenient classification to help us sort through daily life in the world. And what's more, we use similar classifications in all aspects of life. There's no essence of tall or short, for example. There's no generalized universal sad or happy. There is no universal number four. Um, These are merely properties that can describe objects that do exist. Uh, Nominalism isn't much of an active debate these days, so I don't know that we need to spend too much time exploring the nuances. Because Weaver was really putting his finger, I think, on on a movement that we would likely identify today as relativism, or more broadly, postmodernism. He mentions relativism in the book, but a lot of these undercurrents had yet to be branded when Weaver was writing in the late 1940s. And I think that he identified, really he identified an intellectual trend underway, and he just categorized it with nominalism. But, But I think he was aiming at a broader target. So what is relativism? Relativism relativism takes the nominalist attitude toward classifying objects and applies it up to value concepts. So that would be like truth and falsity, right and wrong, and standards of reasoning. Uh, Relativists deny the existence of a universal truth or universal right or universal wrong. Uh, 
Instead, all truth is contingent on a particular context, and that would be on a particular person or a particular people or a particular time and place. Relativists, relativists would say, number one, there is no God. There's no divine lawgiver that stands apart. There's no higher being that can establish eternal truth for us. And number two, there's also no natural law either. So there's no there's no metaphysical or transcendental reality beyond us, you know, whereby if we were to access it, then we could know the truth as it is. Uh, instead, humans only have one another. We create truth and falsity ourselves. We create right and wrong for ourselves. Now, what's more, every society does it a little differently. So genital genital mutilation, let's say, is morally acceptable in one society, for example, while gay marriage is morally acceptable in another. The, the point is that neither society can objectively verify the rightness or the wrongness of their practices. And that's because right and wrong, uh, under the relativist framework, right and wrong is not handed down on stone tablets by God, uh, nor is it found in nature or by science. Instead, it's socially constructed. And that is to say, it's contingent on a given society at a given period in history. <laughs> Under this frame, higher truths do not exist. Value judgments have no external validity. Universal narratives like God or country or family that provide meaning and coherence to the world, cohesion, these are all figments of your imagination. Um, rules and hierarchy in society are deemed socially constructed fictions. Higher truths must give way to little or regional tru truths that are local to groups or individuals. And so that means that every group and every person has his or her own personal truth, and that's equally valid when compared with any and all other truths. So I, I believe Weaver was really responding to what he saw as the upshot of these movements, and that's the dissolution of transcendental truth or higher values. And the consequence, Weaver argues, is the cultural decline of the West. And that's a, an inability to distinguish between good and evil or to perceive any proper ordering of values that leaves no room for any aspirational higher good so in, in the introduction he, he starts off with with nominalism uh, he draws the connections that we've made here and, and that's that nominalism leads to a denial of objective truth and from there he says you can't escape relativism so how do we get to this point well weaver points out or he points to the advance of rationalism and that's the Enlightenment project of situating reason as the primary source of authority, as we know, uh, applying the scientific method and human rationality to understand the world, in contrast to the historical reliance uh, on religion, religious leaders, or traditional systems of power like monarchy. I think it's summed up well, but John Locke taught that man needed only to reason correctly from, upon evidence from nature to discover the truth of things, and we'll actually get into that next week when we talk John Locke. While the growing trust in reason paved the way for modern life, Weaver believed it also imposed some collateral damage. He explains that rationalistic explanations of the world provide less ground for religion or natural law or any higher authority. Humans pass through religious transcendentalism to rationalism and along the way situated themselves as the center of ultimate authority. Now, we usually regard this as a story of progress, and it is, but Weaver believes it also carried with it some negative consequences as well. And what he wants to do with this book is expose some of those consequences, which, again, he believes adds up to the cultural decline of the West. That's a, that's a lot to handle right away. But I, I think the, the point he's getting at about relativism is definitely what the conservatives still talk about today. And it's even more obvious. I mean, you hear all the time people say, speak your truth, that sort of thing. And that's, you know, for Weaver, that's, that's the essence of the sort of madness that is destroying society in his view, that there is truth for you truth for me there's one truth there's one mm -hmm. there's one one thing is true and maybe we don't know it but it's out there i mean i saw that i've seen this in the in the law too i think it was uh oliver wendell holmes was a sort of of the relativist school in a way when he said that the, the law is not a brooding omnipresence in the sky which was sort of a, an opposition to the prevailing view at the time which was more like weavers that men were trying to discover the truth and when we write our laws we're trying to trying to get an exactly right because there is an exactly right. And we're working toward that. And someday we'll figure it out and we'll have the perfect laws. So I think uh, the movement that was beginning in that time, which, yeah, I guess we would call it postmodernism today, is 
well, there's this law, there's that law. Who's to say which is right? Who's to, you know, who's to judge? Yeah, and today we, I mean, I think it does drop to the individual level where you know some of the some of the fervor on college campuses. I mean, some of their refrains is it's not just the uh, the patriarchy, but also science itself is uh, prejudiced in some way. And so, what we need to do is resituate and say, my experience trumps your objective fact. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> because objective fact is um, is uh, illusory and imaginary. Yeah, and that's that's a good is a good starting point for the divide between right and left, which I think a lot of more uh, popular books would not go back to the Middle Ages. And uh, when I and I think most people probably don't think about medieval debates, but the result of that debate does certainly does affect us. Um, so as, as, as esoteric as that starts out to be when you're, when you're reading this, it's the more you read, you say, yeah, that, that actually does make sense. Um, he's, he's onto something important here. I agree. Should we dive in in his chapter one? He titles it uh, sentiment. Uh, it's, it's a discussion of a hierarchy of values and he kind of shows the, the liberal we'll say materialist project is continually to tear down hierarchy, tear down any ordering of values. To him, that's a huge loss because he'll say when religion and metaphysics give, you know, metaphysics being some higher truth that maybe we can't access but exists, Plato called the forms, or he used the allegory of the cave where he says what we see inside the cave is just shadows on the wall when the reality is outside outside the cave. If we could go outside the cave, we could see what reality is actually look like um, that sort of metaphysics that may not be able to access it with our, uh, our human experience, but it's out there. What Weber says is when religion and metaphysics give away, then culture disperses until it lies in fragments. And he thinks, so in a developed culture, he says it's a way of looking at the world through an aggregation of symbols. Man feels like, you know, humans feel like life has meaning and that there, there is a place for you in, in, in the ordering of things. He thinks that we need to clarify that hierarchy of values and restore it um, to provide grounds for the, for the use of our rational faculties because our logic and our, our rationality should work in service to the higher values and not the other way around where the liberal approach is more of a justice before the good. Like we, we need to establish this materialist justice and allow everyone to create their own personal, you know, the good in terms of political theory, um, create their own good. But he says that just create, that just results in confusion. What we need is the vision. We need the good. We need the higher value first as we work towards it. And then we'll bring justice in, in, in behind. Is that the way you see it? Yeah, I think that's, that's definitely what he's, what he's saying. And, um, one sentence that struck out to me is, uh, that stuck out to me was every man participating in a culture has three levels of conscious reflection, his specific ideas about things, his general beliefs or convictions, and his metaphysical dream of the world. And I think mm-hmm. it's, it's that last part that he thinks is passing, passing away or being shattered by postmodernism, relativism. I think that's right. And I don't think, I don't think every person thinks about metaphysics every day. The phrase thought leaders is a modern buzzword, but that's, that's what I'm coming up with. But so the, the extent that thought leaders, the people who shape society are thinking about metaphysics, it trickles down to the rest of us. And, and every person should eventually at some point during his day think, you know, what am I doing? Why am I doing this? You know, does this make sense? I mean, what you said about feeling like the world makes sense, that's, that's important. And I think that's something that uh, the medieval church monarchy system definitely would tell everybody from the king to the peasant, this makes sense. Here's why we do it this way. You know, people have thought about this since, since the days of Plato and Socrates. And, and here's why it is. And you might feel confused about this thing in the world, but believe me, there's a reason. In, yeah, in smashing those structures, I think a lot of, even, even some people who would call themselves on the right, on, on the libertarian right, want to destroy hierarchy. Because, you know, why, why should we set one man above another? You know, why should one group right, right. be in charge? And that, that's certainly an, an, a, a sentiment in American conservatism, leveling in a way. I mean, not by force the way the left wants to level economically, but the idea that my opinion is as good as yours, my vote's as good as yours. Right. Clearly, Weaver is on the other side of that thing. Hierarchy works for a reason. And maybe it's only in a hierarchy that you could have the people at the top thinking metaphysical 
thoughts systems of the world and he gets into that later in the book and we'll we'll get to that the hierarchy is a, is a part of that three stage perception the guys at the top who are really coming up with the systems or or figuring out the systems i should say um mm-hmm. and it kind of it informs the culture below yeah and we should say just as a as a quick footnote we don't want necessarily listen, listeners to get wrapped around the axle on metaphysics i think what what weaver's trying to do here is he wants to bracket the question of is there a God and religion? You know, throughout this book, he doesn't really address it. And he leaves you with the impression that he's agnostic to the question, but it's still, but then it raises the the next question, which is if there is no God, then is there any higher meaning or higher purpose that even exists? And so that's why he's pointing to metaphysics and saying, yes, there is. And kind of the, the, the study or the, uh, the exploration of higher values or hi, higher meaning outside of a paradigm of God, that's, that's metaphysics. So we can think of it in terms of, okay, if we're, if we're setting God aside, uh, does that mean that we set all, all higher value aside? No, no, there's still a question. It, there, there could still be structure of value and the good that we can still access. That is more than just this local, what do I personally think? Or what do you personally think? And what's good for you is good for you. And what's good for me is good for me with no reference, no way to uh, distinguish between the two. Yeah, it's a good way of putting it. Because, I mean, Weaver was, um, he, he he did believe in God. He was a sort of non-denominational Protestant. He didn't really go to church much, but he definitely believed in God, according to what I've read about him. Mm, yeah. But yeah, that, that makes it more accessible to people who maybe are atheist or, or, or believe in the, don't believe in the theistic Western God and the you know, Greek tradition. So yeah, it's sort of, it's sort of God without God, I think. Mm-hmm. He uh, he has an interesting line that I, a couple lines from from chapter one that I thought would be interesting to raise, and he says the the upshot of leveling of hierarchy and tearing down of values, he says is deterioration of human relationships. Kind of the technocratic, materialistic responses for social science to kind of dis- study and figure out what he says is all the tinkering of sociologists can't put homes back together again. And in fact, I think how these days, um, I mean, I, I read a lot of social science, you, you may too, but more often than not, where the studies are really concluding that kind of the old values, the old traditional ways of thinking and, and ordering are actually better for the, for human flourishing and, mm-hmm. and, uh, human psyche and for, and for relationships and, <laughs> And for happiness. Yeah, I mean, we see that more. We see, you see economic studies that say, you know, kids who grow up in a household where their parents are married do a lot better in life. And, you know, in Weaver's time, everyone said, would have said, yeah, duh. But, I mean, in between him and us, the whole cultural sexual revolution and everything else sought to tore down, tear down that nuclear family or at least make it no better than anything else, you know. Mm-hmm. And, yeah, I think you're right. I think we're, and it's, it's sort of funny to read one of those studies as a conservative and say, well, yeah. You know, you're you're rediscovering that you know up is up and down is down. You know, uh-huh. <laughs> yeah. So you have, and I think we'll read these books uh, hopefully down the line. But social scientists like Robert Putnam and Charles Murray, I mean, their studies show pretty plainly that there kind of is a divide, a divide is emerging now between kind of the haves, we'll call them the haves and the have-nots, or those who are upper middle class and those who are lower middle class or whatever. Some of the some of the elements that they point to, some of the factors is kind of the upper middle class. They get married and stay married. They have children after they're married and after they get a college education. And the same is not true of many uh, working class. And this cuts across all races and you know ethnicities. And uh, you know what Putnam will say is actually we have a, a liberal materialist left who's constantly saying in relativist terms, you know your family structure and the way you put things together, that that's up to you. That's your business. And every way is just as good as the other. But then in practice, these same elites from the left, they follow through on the traditional form of family. They'll, they do get married and stay married their whole lives. They do wait until after they're married to have children. They do wait until they're in their late twenties to get seriously date and get married (laughs) after they've gone to college. So there's a little bit of an irony there. Yeah, it's um, it's in a way the success of uh, the meritocratic system is too is a lot of what 
ultimately sorts us in life is the choices we make. I mean, there's that's never completely true. There's always external events that affect us in, in ways and tragedies that befall people. But yeah, things like that, things that do this the traditional way, you know, get married, have the kids, you know, stay together. That that's a choice. And I think as the culture has changed, it's a choice that's harder for people because we've got Hollywood and and these these elites is screaming in our ears. That doesn't matter. Do, do what you want. You know. So I mean, it, it, they've made it harder for folks maybe who aren't contemplating the metaphysical to make the right choice. The hierarchy, as as much as it still exists, is uh, not really much of a hierarchy. It's not telling us anything about right and wrong. He says we need hierarchy. An, an ordered and value laden society has our hierarchy, and he really contrasts this with e an egalitarian society that this conception of ideal. Uh, on the left of egalitarian society in which they seek kind of a, it's more of a materialistic egalitarianism as the ultimate goal. So see, he points out that egalitarianism always presents itself as a redress of injustice, but he'll say to be understandable at all, society has to have structure. And if, if it doesn't have structure, then people don't know where they fit. They don't know where they, they fit in the society or, and he also critiques this idea of an egalitarian society is even possible because we're a flattening where everyone's on the same level. And again, actually, let's point out, he published this in 1948. So he'd seen the beginnings of Stalinist Russia, but he didn't see where the Soviet Union or North Korea or Cuba or North Vietnam, you know, where these societies would later go and, and basically um, vindicate his, his thoughts of them. But but um, anyway, the the absolute level leveling doesn't quite work because what you're doing is you're sub you're taking individual s distinction and and smashing it down. But you're really just you're just sub you'll have to substitute it with bureaucracy. What we're really saying is the inequality of power still persists. It's just that instead of a meritocratic inequality, we have a technocratic, we'll call benevolent inequality. Yeah, and he um. In chapter two, we kind of attacks the middle classes bringing this about, saying that we got more interested in material comforts than in uh, whether things make sense. Uh, you know, this system preserves those material comforts. I mean, people were in 48, you know, they're coming out of the war, everyone's making money. It's kind of it, in some ways was a golden age for America beginning um, as our, you know, we're exporting, everyone's working. It's great. But uh yeah, he's, he's focusing on what what's falling by the way as this is all happening. And uh, says, the middle class owes to its social location and a special fondness for security and complacency. Protected on either sides by classes which must absorb shocks, it would forget the hazards of existence. And that's that's part of his, his he comes back to that, the idea of the hazards of existence and uh, nature as showing us what is true. I think he's, I think he's kind of saying that people aren't living in the real world. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And, uh, yeah, chapter two goes into a lot about hierarchy. He says that order and hierarchy are necessary, so conservatives should treat as enemies all those who wish to abolish the sacred and secular grounds for distinctions among men. And that kind of gets, I think, to uh, something we talked about last week in, in the Goldwater's book, that whereas on, on the left they want e equal results, on the right we want equal opportunity. And mm -hmm. you know, there are distinctions among men and women. We can't destroy them by passing a law. We can't, you know into that Harrison Bergeron world where, where everyone is has equal talents. He doesn't totally get into where the hierarchy develops, but it seems to suggest more of an American hierarchy of uh, rising talent than mm -hmm. than the European. Well, I mean, not I mean, he, he does seem to have some sympathy to the, to the monarchism in, in Europe, but that doesn't seem what like exactly what he's promoting. He's more of the, the Jeffersonian hierarchy. People who achieve success rise up. And that's important. Then. Yeah, that's probably right. That's a good point. He he doesn't really develop that, but I think you're probably right that we can read between the lines. I mean, he says equality before the law has no effect on inequalities of ability and achievement. And in fact, nothing short of despotism could enforce uh, equality of outcomes. So it's almost, he draws a, a vision of hu humans because of our, because talent and intelligence is not distributed equal evenly you are going to you just will have people who rise to the top who who perform well and who perform better and that creates a natural hierarchy it seems i think you're right that's probably what he's saying and the only the only, really the only way to stop that if you want a, an actual egalitarian e 
equality, you're going to have to smash that down somehow. You're going to have to knock down some of those who are higher achievers. And basically, despotism is your only choice. That's that that jumped out at me too. I I, I have that in my notes. That and and that's um I think that is also indicative of his early his student career as a socialist, where being fed this idea that well we're gonna you know force people to do certain things certain ways, but eventually all this is gonna fall away and there will be no government and you know man will live together as brothers and we'll all be happy. And um you know, seeing that go for 30 years in the Soviet Union, and there's only more government, there's not less, there's only more terror, more gulag. I think he could, he could draw on that experience and say, it's it's never going to fall away, because you're always going to require force to keep down those who want to do something different than what the government wants. You're always going to mm-hmm. need force to equalize things, because even if you set everyone at zero today, in 10 years, there'd be somebody who's rich and somebody who's broke, because we just have different right. talents and different experiences and different luck too i mean there is it's not a hundred percent meritocratic but in america it's more often than not your merit so i i I think that that part of his background has has led him to really think on this question of what could we even do if we wanted full equality of of result and there's there's no way and that, that, that is interesting like you said we didn't know the full uh impact of stalinism in 48 i mean it's before the hungarian invasion and all that so while he's writing this, the you know, socialists in the West are still trumpeting the, the, the glorious experiment that's going on in Moscow as a you know perfect society or one to- trending toward perfection. So he's yeah, or in Maoist China later, mm-hmm. the great leap forward and yeah. Now there was an experiment in equality, disastrous result. Yeah, I just thought that was interesting that that that, that equality requires despot. That's a great point for conservatives to think about. Uh, earlier, you. You alluded to some of the costs that uh, that Weaver sees, and I think it's worth pointing out also in this same chapter, what he says is the leveling. It comes at the cost of what he calls fraternity. I think what he's really getting at is you know unity. He says fraternity goes deeper in human sentiment than class and identity resentment. And man, that just jumped out at me, especially in their current moment. Yeah, you got on the right and the left this sort of identity politics and personal. Uh, history and cultural grievance that just yeah the, the whole intersectionality idea is just it it's constant balkanization into smaller and smaller aggrievements and smaller groups and it really i mean it's it's weird because i think people on the right now are really embracing the idea that was on the left during the civil rights movement equal opportunity the colorblind society treat everyone the same you know and then that will be that's justice that's that's fairness that was becoming sort of a mainstream American idea. And now the, the left is leaving that behind, even though in some ways you could credit them for inventing it. The idea of fraternity, the idea of Americanism, you know, this we're all one country. It, it, it's, it's crazy how much people want to shatter us into little bits, each one with his grievances against the others. And that fragmentation is, is so disastrous and dangerous. And personally, right now, I, I seriously worry about uh, about where it's going because you know the identity politics on the left i i think you know i'm not going to say it's it's an exact a to b cause but it definitely is a huge contributing factor to i think where we're at with populist trump phenomenon and rural working class whites becoming conscious of their own <laughs> position and saying oh well okay where if we're if we're going to band together you know like people of color will celebrate them but well, hell, yeah, I think I should celebrate it's the me. The worst then. thing you could hope for is a, 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 the reaction on the right is, yeah, all right, fine, we'll 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 roll with this. This is let's do it. Yeah, let's let, we'll make our own group. That happens enough. There's no middle. You know, there's no overarching American group after a while. And I think if uh, if we were to jump in a time machine and come today today and see kind of the state of affairs, I think he'd say. Well, yeah, this is exactly what happens when we tear down hierarchy, when when we tear down the structure of society. People don't know where they fit, and they want to fit, and so they will find a way to fit. And what we're seeing now is a, is the new fit, which is uh, we're not Americans, you know, we're not uh, cohesive in a in a national sense. Instead, we're more cohesive in our little tribes, our political tribes, our ethnic and yeah, racial it, tribes. Yeah, that, that's a good point that people. People want to belong and people don't always want to be told where they belong, but they want to belong. Maintaining that train of thought, the the criticism of the tearing down of hierarchy and tradition, 
I think he's, he points out, he says like this, the progressive refrain is you can't turn back the clock. And, and, and I think, look, this is legitimate. We, there, they, we have made serious progress, let's say from the civil rights movement, for example, much, let's say most of that is very good, but he still, he's, he wants to say, but yes, but, but things of the highest value, he says, are not affected by the passage of time. Otherwise the very concept of truth becomes impossible. So he says it's conservatives. He says idealists, but he means conservatives really they don't want to turn back the clock, but, but they do want to return and maintain a grounding in some enduring or enduring truth or higher value that doesn't, you know, change with the prevailing winds. Can we preserve something while at the same time moving forward with progress? You, you see that now in a lot of, well, it's 2018. We can't still be, and well, if, if something was true in 1818, it might still be true in 2020 or 2018. You know, I mean, you see this every time mm -hmm. some faction, some fraction of the constitution annoys uh, writers on the left. Well, it's 2018. We still can't have two votes for every state in the Senate. That's like, well, why, why, what does the yeah. calendar have to do with whether that's a good idea? You know, but really it's, it's sort of a shorthand for, I want, you know, I, I want this. You know, uh, uh, times have changed. Well, that, that's not really an argument. That's just a, like a reference to what year it is. Yeah, truthlessness of time, I think that's... I'm sorry, timelessness of truth is... Uh, it's, it's important. Mm -hmm. um, uh, it's something I think most conservatives could probably agree on. And, and as we were just talking about, Weaver's a little bit skeptical of this idea of eternal progress anyway. Let me grab it here. He says... Infinite progress is really just becoming without a goal. The the good is never achieved and in fact is not even achievable. He says, manufacturing purpose in a world without purpose is a form of sentimentality and appeal to shallow, unmoored romanticism. So he's, he's skeptical of the idea that eternal progress is even possible anyway. But that's not to say that some progress isn't possible and is not very good. It's just, what what are we leaving in the wake? Does the leveling turn into sort of a, a Robespierre French revolution where the, the leveling just uproots and destroys all tradition and all, I mean, what is tradition anyway, if not the wisdom of a thousand generations, Th there's reasons that people do things the way that they do and the way they understand the world, the way they do, because it works and we need some innovation. We need some progress, but let's not throw the baby out of the bathwater. He's not against the idea of progress itself, but there is a tremendous arrogance in throwing out tradition. Well, I know better than the thousand generations of collective wisdom that came before me. I'm the one who's really thinking about this. They all thought about it. You know, that accumulated wisdom of society is it's a powerful force. And there, I mean, you're saying that every generation that came before you was wrong. That's a big lift. Well, and, uh, and he points that out and let me, let me find this. He says, norms are broken in ignorant exhilaration. This means sort of the, uh, social experiment, social engineering norms are broken in ignorant exhilaration. And I love this line. The newly emancipated group is convinced that the predecessor, their predecessors feared reality. In other words, didn't make the changes that were absolutely necessary because they feared reality and not for any legitimate reasons. They had their, they had malign motives. We're the ones who were doing it right. And that we're the ones we've been waiting for. Yeah, exactly. And, and as a, as a side note, uh, that's completely incoherent with the whole idea of relativism in the first place, because, you know, relativists and the postmodern situation that we find ourselves in is basically, there is no reference point. So you can't stand up and say, okay, I'm the enlightened one. I've figured it out. Because it's a good point. It's hard even to reconcile uh, relativism and progress. But maybe that's what he's saying when he says that it's about the continual progress is uh, more about the progress than the, the thing you are progressing to. Like when people say life's a journey, not a destination. Well, I don't, I, I think it, there's some destination involved. I mean, you're, if your life isn't just wandering around, bouncing off of things, if you're trying to live correctly, there is a destination. As we move on to chapter four, talks at, um, about how radical individualism harms society. This also kind of goes against the libertarian part of the right today. He says, the sin of egotism 
always takes the form of withdrawal. When personal advantage becomes paramount, the individual passes out of the community. And that, I think, for, for Weaver is one of the highest sins, withdrawing from the community, because it's withdrawing from the structure of society and just living relativism. I'm going to go my way, you're going to go your way, and we're all just, you know, atoms bouncing around. And, and again, yeah, and the individual person is the measure of value, and he says personal advantage becomes paramount, enlightened selfishness. And I think you're right to point out the, the the libertarian streak in this because, I mean, of course, this is the kind of Ayn Rand view of the world is an egotistical, self-centered, what what is of value in the world. Yeah, and he takes that also. This, this chapter also has some thoughts about work and specialization. I'm not sure how this fits in to conservative thinking, but when utilitarianism becomes enthroned, and the workers taught that work is not use and not worship. Interest and quality begins to decline. And how many times have we heard exclamations at, at the wonder and care that went into some article of ancient craftsmanship before modern organization drove a wedge between the worker and its product? That also sounds like it's informed by his former allegiance. You know, the idea of alienating labor is mm-hmm. uh, has its roots in, in Marxism. But here he kind of turns it into a conservative idea that as corporations have grown and assembly lines and men have started doing specialized tasks instead of making a product from beginning to end, it's somehow made the product worse and the worker worse off. I, th- I think this is more nostalgia than than tradition. And I, I, th- I think he's, I mean, the assembly line is a great innovation and it's it made products cheaper and more easily available. And I don't think it necessarily requires a decline in quality. I mean, they, when I was reading this, I was thinking, I mean, you, you think of the assembly line, you think of Ford and cars. And because um, I think that was the first place it was really popularized. And if you had, if every car had to get made by a couple of guys in a garage from beginning to end, they, they would cost more than a house, you know, and they might be of better quality if they were good guys. <laughs> they might not be, you know, have, having systems and having assembly lines and quality checks. I don't think it necessarily makes product worse. I mean, we get a lot of cheap stuff from China nowadays, and you think, well, this is this is crap. This is not well made. And Weaver would probably say, well, that's because it's made by somebody who's disconnected from his labor. But I'm not. I think it's more just they don't care about the consumer, and they're competing only on price. To me, that sniffs a little of of kind of the Marxist critique of mm-hmm. of alienated labor and and the how how capitalism separates you from from your craft. And so I wonder, I have a sneaking suspicion that maybe that's where it's coming from with him having, having been a a Marxist earlier in his life. But, but to the, to the larger point, maybe he's making that he compares work to a a worship and, you know, the idea that if, if, if work is something that's directed by men then, or other, other people, then it kind of leaves you discontented. And he says, dubious about whether work is a good thing at all the the idea that labor and and working hard i think he's right that that is a a kind of a remedy to egotism and even more so he says service to others i personally strongly believe that a good uh, remedy for egotism and and radical uh, self-absorption really is yes working serving others finding ways to to create value for other people and, and for your family and for others. Yeah. I mean, that makes, that makes sense. All right. As we, uh, we're growing a little bit short on time, let's make sure we talk yeah. about the great stereopticon. He, he labels basically the, the media industrial complex, the media machine as the great stereopticon or stereopticon. Let, let's just read a couple of his lines, a few of his lines here and see if we recognize this at all. We have a media machine that dictates reality in the technology age. The audience responds to cues to laugh, cry, react, but never thinks to question. Um, journalists appear omniscient, but generally know little. Reputation of knowledge without the reality. Modern media minimizes discussion, does not encourage a genuine exchange of views. Media companies are under strong pressure to distort in the interest of holding attention. These days, get clicks. Uh, They thrive on friction and conflict, deliberately start and prolong quarrels, create antagonism through accentuation of unimportant differences. 
Yeah, this is great reading for somebody who thinks that the current media landscape is because of the internet. Because he, when he was writing this, it was radio, newspapers, maybe television in some households. And it was the same thing. It's the, it, no different. And he's right. I mean, it, yeah, how often do you watch a show on one of these news networks that is aiming at a solution or a consensus? Just two people yelling at each other for 24 hours. At least on, in his media landscape, it didn't go all night. He, eventually, they uh, put the you know the bars on the TV and the, the static. But now it's, yeah, it goes all at all hours. It's uh, this sort of bombardment. Yeah, and he, he says, no one can remain unaffected. He says, we cannot remain unaffected by the continued assertion of cynicism and brutality. In other words, there is a cost to this. You can't be watching this or listening to this or, or reading this online on your social media without being affected, without becoming more cynical, without becoming more brutal. And he says, who can deny that this media is a world, that the world served up by media is a world of evil and negation? And it just, wow. Yeah, uh, he could be describing Facebook. It's, it's, it is remarkable. And so he says, well, what, what does this have to do with his, with his larger argument? Well, we get to this point because there's no reference point. He says the ultimate source of evaluation ceases to be higher values and of beauty and truth and instead becomes fragmentation, disharmony, non-being. In other words, nothing matters except getting the clicks. So there's... There's no higher order to situate an issue or a problem. Instead, you know, we, we don't have higher values. We don't have a, a transcendental to look towards. So instead, we are stuck with just these facts and facts are debatable and we can scream at each other about them. And there's there's really no reference point. So someone can, you know, a, a president of the United States can say fa facts are fake or your your facts or your news is all fake. And there's it's really hard to rebut that when you're in a situation where there is no higher reference. Yeah. And, and so what, what is it even aiming at selling ads? Um, I think he says it, they want to replace righteousness with happiness. And that's part of the consumer thing he got into earlier is that instead of trying to live rightly, we're just happy to have a lot of nice stuff. Yeah. And <laughs> that's, that's a thing. It's nice to have things. Amusing ourselves to death. Yeah. Yeah. It's great. Um, so in the last uh, six or seven minutes we have here, yeah. should we get to his remedies? He calls private property the last metaphysical right around the world. Ancient rights and freedoms have fallen away. Private property still exists. And he says, we say the right of private property is metaphysical because it does not depend on any test of social usefulness. So it basically is saying it's, it's a right because it's true, not because it's useful. That said, he does think it's very useful for society that people have property, that it, having property allows you to sort of stand against the waves of the government or the stereopticon or every other institution counterweight to everything else that's crashing down is you have your place you can depend on it he also um makes some interesting distinctions about property too which i think you don't hear much in modern conservative thought when he's talking about property he's mostly talking about old-timey property real estate chattels, goods, you know, the things that most of us think of as property when the, when the word first comes to your head, but he doesn't, he's not really very keen on stocks and bonds. Mm -hmm. He thinks that the sort of that sort of corporate ownership and owning a piece of this, a piece of that divides ownership, divides responsibility in a, in a, a firm, the same way that the assembly line divides work and it detaches us from the reality of what's actually going on. His, uh, distinction, which to me sounded kind of like the distributism of, uh, Chesterton and Belloc, which I, I hope we will get into at some point in this podcast. But um, he says, ownership through stock makes property an autonomous unit devoted to abstract ends. The stockholder's area of responsibility is narrowed in the same way as that of the specialized worker. Respecters of private property are obliged to oppose much that is done today in the name of private enterprise. For corporate organization and monopoly are the very means whereby property is casting aside its privacy. The moral solution is the distributive ownership of small properties. Yeah, he seems to key in on this this idea of responsibility that you that you pointed out. It's almost well, he says uh, it's the independent farms and family ho family homes where responsibility can complete a person. So it's almost like what property gives us is an ability to 
add our value to the land and to have responsibility and that responsibility, uh, that work, that level of commitment completes us. I mean, there's something to, it's definitely a different kind of property. I mean, if you own a farm or you own a share of an agribusiness firm, mm -hmm. you behave very differently towards those two pieces of property. I mean, this may be the nostalgia and, you know, because he, he does mm -hmm. his early studies were a lot of the antebellum South and the, the local community, the, the local hierarchy. Mm -hmm. And that's that, that society was agrarian. So it, it kind of, well, how, how persuasive is this to you? Cause I mean, he's, he starts out by saying, again, we need to drive a wedge between the material and the transcendental. We need to reach back to the transcendental. He says no sufficient force to pull human beings upward. We need to validate that there is a world of ought. In other words, a, a higher, a higher order of things. And what he points to is private property. I guess candidly, I just sounded seemed a little bit strange to me. I mean, of course, I'm with him on the on the private property, the value of private property. I'm not sure, quite sure that that's the maybe the remedy for the great stereopticon or for egotism. And I don't know. What did you think about that? I think you're right. I think it's it's good to have, but I don't think it's the the number one cure. I mean, because it's it's related to absolutism, the anti relativism, but it's not the connection is not obvious. I, I agree. Later in chapter nine, in the final chapter, he discusses remedies that I thought he was going to discuss right away. I thought that what his answer would be, um, which is kind of a turning towards a more traditional, a tr traditionalism. He calls it piety and justice. Piety, which I, I take to mean uh, kind of a humility. And he says there's not, nothing short of a recovery of the ancient virtue of piety, or I'd say humility that can absolve man. And it's kind of, uh, he says, what we need to do is is have uh, a greater reflection on, na on, on nature. We need to have uh, more recognition of our, of our neighbor. And what he means by that, I think, is building friendships, relationships. So it's kind of like, sorry, and then he says also a cherishing and remembrance of the past. He says those three things uh, make up piety, like a, t a turning to nature, a turning to relationships that is with your neighbor and a remembrance and a kind of a caring with you of the past. That makes a lot of sense to me. Those can be unpacked a little bit more, but that I think those, mm -hmm. those are the type of factors I think that pull you back away from your self-centered self-absorption, egotism, the great stereopticon. When you're worrying about your neighbor, you you know, you have a, the widow next door needs her driveway shoveled so you get your i got two boys we, we take the boys i take the boys out and we all have a shovel and we shovel the neighbor's walk you know that that detaches them from the video games from the social media from all of the distractions in life so i think to me that that spoke to me a little bit more as a as more of a realistic uh, remedy but i don't know what you thought no i agree and uh, when you we use the word humility i think that's that nails it because that egotism and that escape from tradition, that radical individualism is all arrogance. And it's all what came before doesn't matter. What other people think doesn't matter. What my neighbor does doesn't matter. And that's sort of how you get the atomization of society. Not, not just the atomization of truth, as he would focus it on, but just everything being shattered. And yeah, I think you're right. The humility of mm -hmm. being a part of a community. You don't have to be the leader of it. Just one cog in, in that town and, you know, one person who helps out his neighbor, you know, what's going on at church, what's going on at school. That that kind of does pull your head out of the egotist space. And yeah, and that we're in this together and there's some collective desires and aspirations and there is a coherence to our life together. And even if there isn't a God looking down, um, even if we bracket that and say, well, all we have is each other, then rather, rather than leveling it, uh, our society to to the level of just me and my own desires and wants. You know, you step outside yourself and say, "Well, what does what does a neighbor need, or what does a friend need, or what does a family member need, and how how can I put myself in their shoes?" and And I think many of those institutions that that you just named, church, school, little league, a lot of that has has started to disintegrate too. I think much to my own sadness. I remember uh, just even when I was a kid, there was much more cohesion in the neighborhood. Uh, there was much more of a, a 
a sense of banding together and helping one another. And, you know, if somebody was going to lay sod in their front yard, the whole neighborhood came out to do it together. That's almost unimaginable in my neighborhood now. Not that they're bad people, but just that, that unity and cohesion is just gone. That's a good point. What we have in chapter nine here about the, that that's really the, the bigger lesson of Weaver, as much as I think private property is important for liberty and for other reasons, it's um, the need to refocus on that community is really, I, th- I think, the heart of his message. Cool. So any final thoughts? Well, I, I have to say, when I started this one, I thought, I'm not sure how relevant this is going to be when he was talking about nominalism and William of Ockham and medieval debates, but it really, it does matter. And it that that higher ideal does inform the way we, we relate to each other. So I, I think this is a good read for anyone who really wants to think about what it is mm-hmm. to be conservative, what what it is to live by a philosophy. So I, 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 I'm glad we did this one. It was uh, challenging in its way because it does get at a lot of higher ideas and things you might not have thought about since college philosophy classes. Yeah, I agree. When I when I first started reading, I I did have that I that thought of this this is a little obscure and off the beaten path but i think you know his his nominalism we discussed up front is was just kind of setting the stage for these observations which i found so prescient about egotism about the fragmentation of society about the great stereopticon the um the media establishment that's only become more and more true since 1948 i mean it's so much more true in 2018 than it was in 1948 and so you know by the end and especially as we started putting together our notes for this, it just really jumped out like, yeah, this is, this is a cultural critique that stands the test of time. This is, and it makes some observations that I think conservatism needs to make, which is there is some value in tradition. There is some value in having a higher order of things and ordering our society in a way that, that there is an aspiration that we're moving towards something that some, uh, a, uh, a transcendental truth that can, that can unify us and, create cohesion. And I think even more so today. So I, I'm with you. I'm really glad we read this. It, it is a little bit more rigorous maybe than, than uh, certainly more so than our, our gold water reading from the last, but uh, definitely well worth our time. All right. So thanks for listening. Next week, we're taking up uh, John Locke's second treatise on government. So hope you'll join us then. Thank you.